Good morning. Today I'll share some thoughts about practical policies for decentralized electricity generation, drawing particularly on experiences from Thailand and Tanzania in Africa. I'll talk about a couple things. First of all, what is decentralized electricity? And then I'll look at some practical policies. What is decentralized electricity? A simple definition that works for our purposes is generating electricity from many small local energy sources. The term is generally used in contrast with conventional centralized electricity, which became dominant fairly early in the industrial application of electricity. The idea is that bigger is better because economies of scale in power plants lower costs and improve efficiency. Thus, we have a supply infrastructure dominated by a long legacy of big coal power plants, mega hydropower, large gas-fired power plants, and in Thailand and Vietnam, aspirations for mega-scale nuclear power plants. Here's a few images of centralized versus decentralized. Centralized anything, computing, telecom, or electricity, often has a radial structure with hub and many spokes going outward. In centralized telecommunications, for example, a single TV or radio station broadcasts to passive listeners. Here's some visual examples. Centralized computing, the large-scale old-fashioned mainframes, versus decentralized computing. Lots of people have little laptops. Centralized telecom, the landline with the hub and spoke model, versus decentralized cell phones. The old way in power plants was also very centralized. You had a single large-scale power plant and electricity flowed from this power plant out to customers. In the newer model, decentralized model, there's still the large-scale power plant, but there's also a number of decentralized power plants that can make electricity go um, the other direction. And money also flows in both directions. One of the things that's been driving decentralization has been changes in the economy of scale. It used to be, up through the 1980s, that the bigger the power plants you built, the cheaper they were in terms of dollars per megawatt. But that really changed in the 1990s through mass production of smaller turbines. So no, at that point, no longer was it true that bigger was better. Another aspect of the economics of decentralized power is that transmission and distribution costs are lower. These are the results of a study of the total cost to bring on new generating capacity in Ireland. Decentralized options are less costly than centralized options when one takes into account the cost of additional transmission and distribution required by the different options. One of the factors that's driven decentralized energy is the enormous amount of waste energy from conventional centralized thermal generation. When fuel is burned in a thermal power plant, only about 30 or 40 percent of the energy from the burned fuel is actually transformed into electricity. The other 60 to 70 percent goes up the smokestack or cooling tower as waste heat. This is a diagram showing the total worldwide energy use, and you can see that a large portion, more than 50 percent, goes up into the air in the form of waste. Combined heat and power, or cogeneration, addresses the problem of waste heat by siting generation in places where industrial steam or heating or even cooling is needed. The power plant's waste heat is captured and put to a useful purpose, vastly increasing the efficiency of fuel use. So going from, say, 30% to 40% useful, uh, useful use of the fuel up to about 90%. Cogeneration is widely used in the United States. Here's an example at the University of Massachusetts that provides heating for about 200 buildings. In Denmark, there's been a huge transition from centralized to decentralized energy. In the mid-1980s, uh, there were lots of, there were a few large-scale power plants, and that has largely shifted to uh, many wind turbines and community-scale combined heat and power projects. Today, Denmark gets over 50% of its electricity from decentralized sources. In Thailand, one interesting power project, decentralized power project that many of you have experienced, 
even if you didn't notice it, is the 52.5 megawatt combined heat and power project at the Sawanapum Airport in Bangkok. The power plant makes electricity for the airport and also exports electricity to the grid. The waste heat from the generation of the electricity powers a lithium bromide absorption chiller that cools the entire airport. This project was built as a joint project between EGAT, MEA, and PPT, um, PTT, the Petroleum Authority of Thailand. These are all huge state-owned companies dealing with electricity transmission, distribution, and natural gas supplies. And since they own the grid and the, and the gas supplies, this project didn't require a lot of government policies. The challenge is how to come up with policies that allow regular customers to, inter to implement decentralized generation. While Thailand is actually continuing to steam ahead with centralized energy, they've also put in place some nice policies that are supportive of decentralized energy. And collectively, these have had substantial results in increasing the deployment of renewable energy and also cogeneration. It helps that Thailand has rich renewable energy resources, particularly biomass residues from agricultural industry. Some practical policies that support decentralized grid-connected electricity generation include access to the grid, feed-in tariffs, low-cost financing, and tax incentives. Regarding access to the grid, regulations that provide access to the grid essentially have two components, a set of technical regulations that provide for a safe flow of electricity from the generators to the national grid, and a set of commercial regulations regarding the flows of money to the very small power producer, producer generators. Technical regulations include topics like allowable voltage, frequency regulations, and specified the required protective relays. The commercial regulations focus on how costs are allocated, how tariff amounts are determined, and what happens in the event of disputes between parties. A standardized power purchase agreement eliminates lengthy case-by-case -case negotiations with utilities. The first opportunities for renewable energy in Thailand happened in 1992 when the government initiated the Small Power Producer Program that allowed private sector participation in cogeneration and renewable energy. Small in this context meant up to 90 megawatts, which is small compared to most of the EGAT power plants and also large-scale IPPs. Unfortunately, the SPP program had a number of bureaucratic barriers, uh, so barriers to entry remained high, and only power plants of 10 megawatts or larger generally bothered to apply for the program. The tariff offered non-firm generation rates, uh, or tariffs for non-firm generation that was only about a third of that for firm generation, making it very difficult for all but a few renewable energy plants to participate in the program profitably. The SPP program did lead to a lot of cogeneration, especially in industrial estates, petrochemical factories and so forth. Here are some photos of some of these. They mostly generate electricity and sell steam to industry. The Thai regulations for very small power producers were initially improved, approved in 2002. And these regulations allowed projects, renewable energy projects, to come online as long as they used uh, renewable energy and exported less than one megawatt of power. The tariffs were originally set at the cost per kilowatt hour that Thailand's distribution utilities paid for power that they bought from EGAT. In 2006, the utilities started to feel comfortable with how this was all working out, and they increased the limit up to 10 megawatts of electricity export per project. And they also added cogeneration to the, to the mix of allowable projects. Importantly, they also added a feed-in tariff adder, which is a technology-specific payment for uh, renewable energy. In 2009, the tariff was increased to uh, provide a little bit of additional money for projects that specifically offset diesel generation in rural areas, and also uh, paid a little bit more for projects that were in the far south. There is an English version 
of the regulations and a model power purchase agreement at this website. This is a table showing Thailand's speed and tariff adder. And I'll just point out a couple of things. One is that uh, it depends on the technology. So biomass gets a bit less money uh, than, than other sources. Biogas uh, and biomass both get uh, uh, 0.5 or 0.3 uh, baht per kilowatt hour. Wind gets a bit more. Uh, solar gets the most at about 6.5. It also depends on the capacity. Uh, larger projects get a bit less uh, tariff and, and uh, smaller projects get a bit more. And then it depends on where the project is located. If it's in a remote island, for example, where it's offsetting diesel, it gets another additional bot. Um, and if it's in the three southernmost provinces where there's some political risk, it gets some additional payment. These tariffs are on top of the, uh, basically on top of, of the uh, avoided wholesale cost of electricity, so um, which is two to three baht. Feed-in tariffs are widely used around the world, and here's a map showing uh, where where tariffs, feed-in tariffs, are used. Um, in addition to feed-in tariffs, Thailand also implemented a revolving loan fund. And the way that worked was that the Thai government loaned funds at zero percent interest rate to commercial banks, and that they in the commercial banks, in turn, loan this money to project developers with, at a maximum interest rate of 4% and a maximum loan amount of 50 million baht um, and a, a loan period of, of seven years. Uh, these loans were specifically for energy efficiency improvement projects and renewable energy development projects. In addition to the low interest loan fund, there was an ESCO fund which was provided uh, equity investment and equipment leasing. Thailand also uh, provided tax incentives for renewable energy. Um, one of the tax incentives was uh, reductions of, of import duties on renewable energy equipment, and another was a corporate income tax holiday of up to eight years, um, and then an additional uh, income tax holiday, corporate income tax holiday of up to 50% for uh, the additional five years. Here's some examples of some projects that have come online under, under the Very Small Power Producer project, um, under the VSPP program. This is a microhydro project uh, that was originally an off-grid project and then later connected to the grid. This is a 40 kilowatt project in, in Chiang Mai that's uh, that was selling electricity back to the, the grid and, and has the potential to make about 40, uh, 400,000 baht per year worth of electricity. Uh, here's a large scale solar installation, uh, one megawatt of PV. These are uh, solar panels made in Thailand. For scale on the far right hand side of the screen here, uh, this is a, a six lane highway. This is an even larger project, 73 megawatts of PV spread over 1,000 rai, uh, or about 160 hectare, hectares. Uh, a, a lot of the power purchase agreements that were signed for solar electricity were actually signed for solar thermal, um, and there's now signed PPAs for over 1,300 megawatts of solar thermal electricity. This is the first solar thermal project that was built under the, under the VSPP program and it's got five megawatts, uh, another 135 megawatts are planned. It was commissioned uh, last year, about this time. Pig farms have been a, a big one. Um, prior to the VSBP program, they, they were a big, uh, pig farms were a big problem uh, where they, they smelled bad and they uh, produced pollution that really caused problems with local groundwater. And these pig farm biomass systems uh, capture the pig waste, make methane with it, and burn the methane in, in uh, modified diesel generators to produce electricity. Cassava has also been uh, important. Uh, in, a, in a tapioca factory, which uses cassava, uh, there's a lot of wastewater which is produced. And that wastewater gets pumped into a big holding tank, like this one shown here, which is covered uh, with a, a, a uh, high density polyethylene cover and inside uh, methane is created which gets pumped to these uh, generators to make electricity. These are three one megawatt 
uh, generators, which power the factory and, and also sell surplus back to the grid. Uh, here's another one. This is a, a, a rice husk fired power plant that uses rice husk from a rice mill, uh, 9.8 megawatts. There's a number of biomass projects of this scale. And these set of slides trace the uh, evolution of the program starting in 2007 and traces applications that were pending under the program, those that have received permission, those that have signed power purchase agreements, and those that are finally generating electricity. And you can see um, that by last year, uh, there's over a thousand megawatts of renewable energy online. Most of it is biomass. There's a, a, a hundred megawatts or so of solar um, and, and a fair amount of biogas. And then there's a lot of, of um, over 1800 megawatts each of of uh, biomass and, and solar electricity with signed power purchase agreements, but not yet generating electricity. Solar has been really um, interesting in this regard, going from just about nothing in 2007 um, and really uh, increasing exponentially um, to, uh, well, as of about a year ago, um, uh, about 140 megawatts online, and, and there's power purchase agreements for about 2,000 more megawatts if you combine the PV and the concentrating solar thermal. Um, since this graph was made, it's also grown significantly. In Tanzania, uh, similar regulations uh, have been written. I've, I've been uh, working on these regulations um, with the government. Uh, we started working on them in, in, and approved them in, in August 2009. Um, like the Thailand situation, they allow up to 10 megawatts of export. Um, Tanzania is a very different country than Thailand, much poorer, and it has big problems with power shortages, especially when there's droughts. Um, to meet the demand for electricity, the Tanzanian utility has purchased very expensive generation capacity uh, through emergency procurement contracts. And what amazes me is that in Tanzania, they're not so interested in renewable energy, but they are interested in getting some generation online. And, and, and these policies have been helping a lot with that. Um, unlike Thailand, Tanzania does not have the money to pay uh, for technology-specific, more expensive feed-in tariffs. They, they pay the avoided costs, uh, which in the case of grid-connected SPPs is right now around 9.6 uh, American cents per kilowatt hour. And they, they do this interesting thing for mini-grid projects, for, uh, for remote mini-grids not connected to the main grid, which are currently powered by diesel generation. Um, they have a separate avoided cost, which reflects the high cost of diesel in these grids. And those uh, that have, if you want to make an SPP project that connects to those projects, uh, to those mini-grids, you get 24 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, right now, there's three... SPPs in operation, totaling over 15 megawatts of power, which is actually quite a bit considering that the um, total capacity of the Tanzanian grid is only about 800 megawatts. Um, there's another dozen or more than a dozen uh, projects in the pipeline. English versions of the Tanzanian regulations and model power purchase agreements are available here. And some of the, one of the things that was done in Tanzania was to specifically encourage uh, decentralized uh, generation in rural areas. And one of the ways to do that was to, was to focus also on off-grid or mini-grids. And, and uh, these regulations allow off-grid generators to pick their own tariff for electricity that they sell to retail customers. And there's a simple spreadsheet that helps the regulator to, um, to monitor and approve these tariffs. That spreadsheet's available at this website. And another question that arises with what happens when the, the main grid connects with the mini grid. And uh, these policies in Tanzania allow a formally off-grid generator uh, to connect back to the grid and sell electricity back to the main grid, or to con or the operator can continue to operate its mini grid and purchase electricity at wholesale uh, from the main utility and, and, and sell to retail customers. Here's some projects that have come online in, in Tanzania. This is a 300 
kilowatt uh, remote mini grid. This is a, a 17.5 megawatt project uh, of which about four megawatts are being sold to the grid um, at a sugar factory just below Mount Kilimanjaro. And here's a project that just came online about a month ago. It's a four megawatt hydropower project selling electricity to the main grid as well as um, expected to serve about a thousand retail customers by February of this year. So to summarize, um, important aspects of policies to help with decentralized generation are guaranteeing access to the grid, uh, feed-in tariffs, uh, providing low-cost financing, providing tax incentives, and for remote mini-grids, flexibility in retail tariff setting, and uh, reducing an investment in reducing investment risk by working out the details of what happens when the big grid reaches the small grid. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, and I look forward to um, uh, any questions that you might have. You could feel free to email me at this address. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.